So obviously we're going to go through anatomy and physiology level two today. Um, I'm going to take you through the various aspects and units that you, you will cover for your um, level two anatomy and physiology exam. Um, so let's get you started. So the aim of this section um, is obviously to cover all the knowledge required to pass your theory paper, which is basically 40 questions. Um, there's 28 marks that you need to get overall, which is 70%. Um, that will get you a pass. Um, it works out to be 28, obviously, at 28 out of 40. Um, it's multiple choice, so um, it gives you some options, some easy options, some harder options. I always find if you eliminate the ones that are um, definitely not the answers, it usually dwindles down to about two. Um, hopefully you'll know the answer straight away and hopefully the revision session is going to help you a little bit as well on top of any of the reading you've been doing. So the first section we're going to look at is skele the skeleton. Um, so the idea is we're going, to, we're going to talk about the major bones in the, the skeleton. We're going to look at the basic functions of the skeleton. We're going to look at the different structures um, of the skeleton. So the axle and the appendicular skeleton. Uh, we're going to identify the roles of the, uh, the role of the spine and how it affects exercise on spine alignment, and we're going to describe the effects of exercise in terms of age, inactivity, and hormone status on the skeleton as well. Um, the bottom one is um, it's not a huge section, but we cover it enough just so that you know it. Um, you, you're not going to have loads of questions on hormonal status of the skeleton, not really. Um, so, what does the skeletal system consist of? Well, you should know it's 20, uh, 206 bones in total. Um, it's really important for you to remember that bones are attached to other bones by ligaments, and the bones are attached to muscles by tendons. We have cartilage that covers the ends of each bone and a joint and allows friction free movement. So when we're looking at the skeleton, we've obviously got the, the front and back of the skeleton, um, which is the anterior and posterior. Um, you should have these in these diagrams in your books. Um, now, when you're looking at basic functions of the skeleton, obviously it's really, really important because you will get a question on this as well. So when we look at the basic functions we're looking at muscle attachments and movement so that's what bones that's what bones are used for they're going to store minerals they're going to protect the vital organs they're going to keep our shape of our body and they're going to help production so the production is the marrow cavity of the bones the sternum um, and it's a site of the production of white and red blood cells so it's basically going to produce white and blood uh, white and uh, red blood cells within our body. So muscle attachment, obviously the long bones of the skeleton is acting as a lever. Muscles attach to long bones and pull on them to create more movement. We have storage of minerals. So with uh, the minerals, minerals such as calcium, phosphate ions are stored in the bones to be drawn upon when necessary. So for example, with muscle contraction, uh, we, I'm going to talk about that muscle contraction in a few slides time, so that I'll go over that. So remember about the storage of minerals. Uh, the protection of vital organs, that's the definition of obviously we've got the rib cage that protects the vital organs um, and our pelvis um, is also going to protection of vital, um, vital organs as well. And obviously without our bones, we wouldn't have shape. We wouldn't ha have our structure of our body and how it works. Um, there are three types of, uh, of body shapes. You've got your um, mesomorph, which is the one in the middle, the more athletic shape. You've got your endomorph, which is the larger of the two, which is on the right. And on the left is your ectomorph. The ectomorph is like some that would be doing marathons, usually quite lean. Um, that's your ectomorph. Now, you usually get questions on somatotypes in your exam. So it's definitely worth 
making a little note or a star next to that section because it does tend to come up um, in your theory paper. Obviously, there's different divisions of the skeleton. So we have the axle and the appendicular. The axle is 80 bones. Um, it lies on the long axis or the midline of the body and includes the skull, the vertebrae, the sternum and the ribs. And I always think about it as if you had the axle the middle part of a car. It goes right through the middle of the car and then everything on the outside, the wheels, um, steering wheel, stuff like that, anything that's on the outside, the um, doors of a car, they're almost in effect like our arms and our hands and they would be on the, they'd be the appendicular skeleton. So everything on the outside, your legs, arms, they're all part of the appendicular skeleton. So you've got your shoulder girdle, arms and hands, pelvic girdle, legs and feet. That's all appendicular. Um, the appendicular is the part of the skeleton that obviously provides the movement, whereas the axle provides the protection for our body. Um, usually you get a question on something like that, the division of skeleton. So it's worth making a note. Um, there's a, there should be a diagram in your books as well. Um, but it's definitely worth making a note on what an axle skeleton and what an appendicular skeleton is because it does crop up in the exam sometimes. So there's just a diagram of it there. You can see um, you've got the axle all the way through, goes through the middle and then everything coloured. Here you can see the colour of the bones. This is all your appendicular that runs along there. Um, your shoulder girdle comes down. Um, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. I didn't, want, I didn't want to be explaining saying moving my cursor around to different parts and you thinking, what the earth are you talking about? Um, so, so, yes, you can see the outside and then obviously you've got the protection of the vital organs, which would be all around here. And that's the axle. Okay. We have obviously important part is the vertebral column or the spine. Spine is split into the section. So we've got the cervical curve. We've got the thoracic curve, so the thoracic vertebrae. We've got the lumbar vertebrae. And then we've got the sacral vertebrae. And then you've got the coccyx or coccygeal, which is just there. Um, so the vertebral column, obviously there's 33 individual bones in total. So you've got seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and five coccygeal. Coccygeal, the coccyx, is fused to form the coccyx. So the, see it's, a co um, it's a coccygeal, and then obviously the, it, it fuses together. Um, the same as the sacral is fused together to call, um, to form the sacrum. Okay, so when you look at the vertebral column, all the vertebrae join to one another to form a flexible column. Um, obviously, this is going to be support the trunk and the head and enclose and protection of the spinal cord. In between each vertebrae, there are an intervertebral disc or fibrous cartilage, which acts as a shock absorber between each of the vertebrae. Obviously, we've got four natural curves um, with, that form the vertebrae through the thoracic, uh, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. Um, and th these obviously these curves keep your body in a neutral spine or a neutral alignment. Um, and they keep you up, they're going to help you keep upright and maintain posture more easily. Um, what you've got to remember is that you'll see with some clients, especially when you're training them, you might see clients with lordosis, which you'll find is a bit excessive of the of the lumbar part of the spine. So there's an excessive lower curve. You've got kyphosis which is the upper part into the um, thoracic and cervical. And you'll see it's almost a little bit like a hunchback. So it hunches right over. So these are obviously posture. When you do, if you do posture analysis, if you're doing PT, you, this would be quite important because you want to check to see someone's body alignment. 
Scoliosis, obviously you can see straight away the the pressures. If if you had a bar going across and you were doing squats, you can see the force coming down through the spine and how that curve would be quite painful if you're in a squat position and the weight's being forced downwards. Um, so the next section we're going to look at is the bones themselves. We look at the classification of bones. Um, the structure of a long bone, the stage of broad bone growth, which is important because you will get questions on that as well. Um, so obviously we've got different classifications. We've got long bones, short bones, irregular bones and flat bones. So long bones are found in the limbs. Their length is greater than their breadth. Um, and they have a tubular shaft and usually an epiphysis at the end covered by a haline cartilage a haline cartilage sorry and they're going to be for movements your long bones are like your um upper arm your femur where your short bones they're found mainly in the hands and foot um and they're roughly cuboid shape as you can see this is a picture here of someone's foot or the skeleton of, of uh, the foot a regular bone obviously a regular bone is going to be found in your vertebrae so obviously you've got your spinal cord which would be here it's composed of a thin cell of compact bone with an interior of cancellous bone and it's obviously for protection of that spinal cord and then you've got your flat bone and this bone here is the scapula so this is looking at the, at the back of you it's composed of a thin and inner and outer layers of compact bone separated by a layer of um, cancellous bone and it's obviously going to be really good for muscle attachment um, now with bone growth there's a couple of key words i've highlighted one there that's really important you need to remember for bone growth especially for your theory so obviously bones are living and need a good blood supply in order to bring nutri uh, nutrients and oxygen they're also going to help to get rid of waste products as well. Now, the bones also need nerves to send information to the brain about pain or damage caused to the bone. So bones at birth are mainly cartilage. And as the skeleton matures, calcium and magnesium are deposited within the cartilage by osteoblasts. So these are bone building cells, osteoblasts. There's the whole process of bone formation or bone growth is known as ossification. So that is a really key word that it might be worth jotting down just for your exam. Ossification is quite a big one that comes up. So when we look at ossification, ossification is all about um, bone growth, basically. Um, at the age of 25, you should be fully completed with ossification. Um, and the cartilage gives the bones their resilience and calcium gives them their hardness. So the structure of a long bone, obviously you've got your compact bone, which forms the main shaft of the bone. We have then the spongy bone, the cancerous bone, which is found at the ends of each of the bone. And then we have our red marrow, which is produced red and white blood cells, and this is found in the in within the cavity of the bone shaft so in the middle mm -hmm. the exceptions of the ends of the bone or a fibrous sheath which is covers the bones this is called peristernum and basically this runs around the outside the peristernum has a rich supply of blood vessels providing nutrients for the bone cells during growth and repair so the peristernum goes on the outside. I'm hoping there's a diagram. On, I should have one. Um, I haven't. It is in your books. So you definitely should have one in your books. Have you, are you, have you got your books with you? Yeah. So you'll, you'll have a picture of that in your book. Um, you may get questions that would come up, probably this one here, peristernum. Um, but the highlighted words I've got there for you, obviously they're important to remember. So that's the that's obviously give you an example of a long bone that sh you should know is the femur. 
Um, so ossification, um, important implications for exercise. So growing bones um, are, are vulnerable to damage. Exercise training with children therefore requires care. Research would suggest that exercise for young children needs to be done at moderate intensity to have a positive effect on bone development. Resistance training with children should consist of high reps and low resistance, whereas heavy strenuous work with young children could lead to overuse injuries and fractures of the epiphyseal plates, which could affect growth and future bone development. That is again a few times you may that may they may come up in the exam worth looking at it's about bone growth in young children and uh and fractures of the epithelial plates um it's worth making a little note about that as well okay that is affecting bone growth bones change their size and shape during a lifespan so that's obviously going to change increasing age and inactivity can lead to bone demineralization of fragile bones which is osteoporosis regular weight bearing exercise will increase bone density making it stronger as a result of the pulling forces exerted by the muscles on the bone well you got to remember osteoporosis may come up as well um it's quite a common one it's good it's a good thing you need to know you will have clients that may have osteoporosis so this is where the bones become thinner and more fragile exercise does not need to be vigorous everyday activities such as walking or swimming are beneficial any weight bearing exercise program is effective as it is encourage um it will encourage an increase in bone density bones become stronger due to the pulling forces exerted on the muscles Without this action, bone loses calcium faster than it can be replaced, hence osteoporosis. Um, before I move on, is there any questions on that? Um, what's that word that started with a P, sorry? Peristernum, so it's that one there. That one there. Okay, that's fine. You know, that's, uh... Cool. At the end of each section, if you've got a question, just let me know straight away because then we can we can always go back to it as well. So that's fine. So joint classification, obviously with joints again, what you'll find is you, with the questions on the paper, there's about four or five different papers that you could potentially get, and the, the best thing to do is just you going through the whole manual so you really understand it all. But you know, there's not going to be one section that concentrates on more so. It's good to have an understanding of each section, and it's, it's that's only going to be good for your knowledge as well. Um, so with the joints now, joint classification, there's three classifications. You've got immovable um, or fused or fibrous um, joints. We've got slightly movable, so the, like the thoracic vertebrae, um, also known as cartilaginous. And then you've got your freely movable, which is known as the synovial joint. Um, Shoulder is the best one for that because you you've got various different moves you can do with your shoulder joint. Um, so with synovial joints, the structure is articul um, articular cartilage which lines the ends of the bones for smooth movement and it helps with shock absorption. You've got your joint capsule which is a sleeve-like capsule that encloses the joint cavity. We have the synovial membrane which secretes, secretes synovial fluid into the joint um, and then synovial fluid which lubricates the joint um, synovial fluid obviously you would that's going to be created like especially when you warm up your joints will be, be more mobilized and and um, this synovial fluid goes around the joints so that they don't rub together so it doesn't hurt and you don't cause an injury for yourself um, and it just it just creates smooth tracking within that joint um, which is why it's so important to warm up. Um, we've got ligaments and tendons, and we spoke about that already. So ligaments, obviously, when you're looking at ligaments, it's bone to bone. Tendons would attach muscles to bones. Um, so it's important to remember. There's a uh, synovial joint structure there. So obviously you've got your ligament, you've got your articular cartilage, 
Um, she's here. Synovial cavity or the fluid. So the fluid comes into there, goes through and around the joint. Um, this is the outer of a bone, obviously the peristernum, and then the synovial membrane, which is this bit, very bit that goes all the way around. Like that. Yeah? Yeah. So we've got different types of joints. So we've got a gliding joint. Gliding joint can be found in the hand. Hinge joint, so it could be found at the elbow or the knee. We have a pivot joint. Pivot joint can be found in, in the wrist. There's the ball and socket joint, which is found in the hip, and the, in that diagram is the shoulder. And then we've got a saddle joint. Saddle joint um, is found in the thumb. So we have a saddle joint in our thumbs. We also have one in our jaw as well, but we don't need to go in that much detail. There's your condyloid joint. Look at the phalanges for the condyloid. Um, any questions on that one? No. No. I'm. I'm. The only thing is, I'm conscious that we're running. We're going through it quite quickly. Um. So, but I want to make sure you're taking it in. So, if there's any questions you have, obviously, I'm going to keep asking you these questions. Um. But feel free to jump in at any time. So anatomical positions, obviously different anatomical positions. We've got the frontal plane, which is this one here, and we've got the posterior plane. So anterior, posterior, yeah? Um, so when you're looking at what we're doing is joint actions, we're looking at the movements. So movements are really important because it's important to understand how our body moves and what we need to do when, when it's moving. Um, especially when you're trying to create exercises for clients. Okay, so the first one is flexion and extension. So flexion will reduce an angle at the joint or to bend a limb. So bending the arm at the elbow, whereas extension is to return from flexion and increases the angle of the joint. Or strength, or strength, uh, straightens, um, so straighten the limb, so extending the arm or straightening the leg. So if you're sitting on a machine and you lift your legs up, that would be a leg extension. Whereas if you're pulling it down, it'd be a leg curl, but that would be flexion. So because the flexion is you're reducing the angle. So if you was doing a bicep curl. Would it be, if I was lifting the bar up, would I be doing flexion or extension, do you think? Flexion. Reflection. Yeah. yeah, so arm flexion. Whereas if I do extension, what am I doing? Extension. So what, where's my hand going? Down. Down, that's it, thank you. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a trick question, <laughs> I promise. Um, so it sounds really like obviously it's really simple when you think about it but when you're talking about it when you it's easy to read it but without practicing i mean even when i'm doing it i don't know if you i don't know if you're moving your arms up and down um but it gets you thinking about it as well when you start moving the arms so there's your flexion and extension of the arm we've got abduction and adduction now I always, whenever I try to remember these, I think, right, what do, what does, what do they say? What do they mean? So, if you abduct something or adduct something, so if I abduct something, what would I be doing to it? So, okay. I'd be taking it away, wouldn't I? So, I abducted someone. Um, I, I usually say children, but I'm recording this too late. <laughs> Um, so if I was to abduct someone, I'd be taking it away. So abduction is to take away from the midline of the body. Whereas if I say adduction, I think I'm adding, add towards the midline of the body. So if I bring, so if I bring my legs out to the side, I'm doing abduction. If I bring them back in, I'm doing adduction. Yeah. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so adduction, adding towards the midline, abduct, taking away. 
just like the diagram says. So you've got obviously you've got your femur there, your pelvis, abduction and adduction. We've got rotation, so uh, a rotary movement inwards or outwards, so turning the hip in and out or rotating through the thoracic vertebrae, just like this diagram. So it's just twisting round side to side. So it rather goes not side to side, but you're just twisting through your body. Um, the same as if you was to stand up and you to, if you turn your feet inwards, you're, you're gonna be doing rotation of the hip joint. So that'd be internal rotation. External rotation would be taking your feet out to the side. Like in a like duck position with your feet. We have circumduction. Circumduction is basically just taking your arm by your side and then bringing it, lifting your arm all the way up, taking it all the way around to the back. So doing a big circle with the arm, and that is circumduction. It looks like that. So you basically you did start here and you just take it all the way around and over in a circle in a circle position. Yeah. We've also got a horizontal flexion and extension, so movement in a horizontal plane, drawing the arm across the body as in a pec deck. Um, horizontal extension is a backward movement in a horizontal plane, which looks like that. So bring, the, bring it, your arm across one side and then bring it out to the other side. We have elevation and depression. So this is basically lifting your shoulders up and dropping them down. So when someone's feeling, I always think if someone's feeling down, depressed, they shut their, they look down, they're looking downwards, their shoulders are slouched downwards and they're all feeling depressed. Whereas if you're elevated, you lift yourself up a bit, you stick your chest out, shoulders back, shoulders go up. So elevating, elevate to lift and raise a joint, lifting the shoulders, depression to to drop or lower a joint, so dropping down the shoulders. So elevation, shoulders to the ears, depression coming down um, and relaxing those shoulders downwards. Just like so. Okay, so we've got lateral flexion and extension. So lateral flexion is to bend side uh, sideways with the trunk or the neck. So, for example, standing side bends or tilting the head, whereas lateral extension is to straighten from a side bending movement and then obviously returning back to a neutral position. So you've got lateral flexion and then oh, and then extension would be coming back to the middle again. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Perfect. OK, so we've also got pronation and supination. So. Pronation is turning the palms down. Supronation is to turn the palms up. A um, little bit like if you supinate a bowl of soup, holding your hand um, in a cup position, like in Oliver. When he goes, please, sir, I want some more. He's in a supine position. He wants some soup. He wants some more. Uh, pronated is obviously the opposite to that. So prone, face down. Supine face up, so that um, when we are talking to clients, so we'd either go, "Can you go? Can you lay face down, or can you lay face up?" That's obviously an easier way. But if we look at um, anatomy and physiology, we want to use the correct terms. Face down would be prone, and supine would be face up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. We've got ankle movement as well. So we've got plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So plantar flexion, I plant the toe down. So plant the toes away from the body. Um, so an upward movement of the of a standing calf raise. So if I was doing a calf raise, that would be plantar flexion. But if I point my toe, I'm doing plantar flexion. A dorsal dorsal flexion is to pull the toes towards the body so digging the heels into the ground um and i always think if you like you bring your foot up into um 
what would be a dorsal flexion position, like the dorsal fin of a of a shark or something. So you keep it upright and it's straight. Um, and that is in obviously uh, your foot. And it's like that. So we've got protraction and retraction. So protraction, the shoulders are drawn forwards, rounding the shoulders, where retraction is the shoulders are drawn back. That's to bring the shoulder blades or the scapulae or scapula as they close together um, as possible and push the chest forwards. So if you was to roll your shoulders forwards now, you can see that's protraction. Retraction is rotating the shoulders up towards your ears and back squeezing the shoulder blades together and that's retraction um, and they're really important for when you're training people and doing exercises because it's really good to know um, the position and how they work because it's going to help you engage the muscles more when you're training with someone uh, the deck diagram isn't the best but it'll give you an idea Okay, so bones and joints are special populations. So obviously you need to work on a case-by-case -case basis for an individual, but bear in mind the following changes. So young people in the 14 to 16 age range, growing bones are not fully oss ossified. Therefore, they're more vulnerable to damage. So you shouldn't do any heavy lifting, strenuous or repetitive exercises. Pregnancy, stability of the synovial joint affected by the hormone relaxing. So the hormone relaxing is what um, creates flexibility in the ligaments. Um, so when someone's pregnant, you obviously need to be careful of that because you don't want any bones popping out um, or dislocating. Avoid a high impact exercise and fast changes in direction, obviously because of the, that weak area. We're looking at ageing as well, special populations. So you can, if you age, you've got a decrease in bone density, which means you're more susceptible to fractures and osteoporosis. A decrease in synovial uh, fluid, so you get stiffer joints. The cartilage starts to really get thin, so reduce sugar absorbency, less uh, elastic um, ligaments and tendons, and reduce joint stability. You obviously got age-related diseases as part of aging, and with a disability, limitations would be affected by that disability. So that'll be a, again a case-by-case -case situation. Um, okay. So, any questions on what we've done so far? So far, no. No, it's a lot to take in. On, I know. Okay, so session aims. We're going to look at the muscle tissues and their characteristics. Uh, we're going to describe the structure of skeletal muscle. Um, so what we've got here is obviously there's three types of muscle tissues, and you will get possibly get questions on these. So you need to know what they are. So obviously we've got voluntary involuntary and cardiac muscle voluntary muscle and this is how i learn it so if i volunteer something so if i if i wanted to do voluntary work that would be my decision i would make that choice no one's telling me if i if i've got a job and i'm told i have to go in on nine o'clock on my roadside every day that's involuntary i have to do that so that being said if i look at my body it, to take a bar and lift it up with my biceps. My biceps would be voluntary because I decided whether I wanted to lift it up. Whereas my invol an involuntary muscle would be something like my heart or my digestive system because that has to continue to work. If it doesn't, my body will shut down. So whenever we are looking at different, so like cardiac muscle, it's an involuntary muscle. It's straighted in appearance. Um, and it's not under um, con our conscious control. Um, so for me, I know that straight away my heart pumps automatically because you know what it's like for us, us gentlemen, trying to uh, do them thing at a time. If we had to remember to talk, exercise, and 
uh, pump her heart at the same time. One of them is going to go wrong, um, and I won't want the heart to go wrong. So thank God that's involuntary muscle. Yep. Uh, it's a nice little structure there, and a diagram of of a, of a muscle and the breakdown of how the muscle fiber looks you're looking at the myosin and actin we're going to talk about this now so this part here is really important so we're going to talk about muscle contraction and how the muscles contract um there will be questions on actin myosin maybe the sarcomere um so we're going to talk about that so obviously muscles attached to the skin via tendons we have muscle fascia which converges to form the tendon which attaches to the bone. We've got a perinosis, which is flattened tendons of other muscles, for example, the abdominals. Um, and these are directly onto the bone via muscle fascia. Okay, so muscle contractions do general rules. Obviously, muscles pull other muscles. A muscle crosses the joint, a muscle contracts along a line of fiber and muscles work in pairs so which is why sometimes you have training programs where you would do chest and back biceps triceps uh, quads and hams so they're, they're working in pairs now if we look at the muscles themselves obviously muscles working in pairs as we said front and back biceps triceps we've got the prime movers which would be your agonists then you've got your secondaries which is your antagonists so if i was doing a bicep curl what would be the antagonist muscle do you think say that again sorry so if i'm if i was just to do a bicep curl what would be my antagonist muscle tricep yeah whereas the agonist would be the bicep what if i was doing a leg extension extension um hamstring Hamstring would be the antagonist, whereas because I'm it's the leg extensions when you obviously you raise your legs up to squeeze the quadriceps. So the quad would be your agonist, and the antagonist would be your hamstrings. Okay. So antagonist is just the opposite muscle that relaxes. Okay. So when we're looking at these these muscle contractions. What you want to look at is, and again, this will come up in your exam, different types of muscle contractions. You've got concentric, which is muscles develops tension and shortens overcoming load and gravity. So I always think concentric, I'm contracting the muscle, so the muscle's getting shorter, where eccentric is when the muscle lengthens. So it's resisting that load. And eccentric is quite common um with muscle tears so micro micro uh, micro tears of the muscle fibers so it's very common with what we call doms delayed onset muscle soreness oh can you hear me hello yeah i've got you now um, so next contraction is isometric. So an isometric is a static or held contraction. So it'd be like if you was doing a pulse pull set. So this say you was you're doing a bicep curl and then you you held it there and just held the muscle in its contraction. That would be an isometric contraction. An isotonic contraction is moving is a moving contraction. So concentric and eccentric phase. So an isotonic contraction would be, have you ever done um, like bench press or bicep curls using resistant bands or chains? Yeah. Uh, so if you think, if you ever use like chains for training, so if you see people doing chains on the, on the, on the uh, barbell when they're doing bench press, you think, what on earth are they doing that? It's because it adds... Uh, weight during both phases both the obviously the it's an isotonic contraction so it's move the moving of concentric and eccentric phases it just adds load to it as well so that would be an isotonic contraction now um 
these are important to remember because they have come up on exam questions, um, especially concentric and eccentric comes up quite a lot. So you need to remember concentric is contracting a muscle, eccentric is the opposite, it's lengthening. Yeah? yeah. Muscle fibre types. Okay, so skeletal muscles are made up of several different types of fibres and they vary in two ways. Colour, speed of contraction. So you've got your type 1, which is your slow, and your type 2, which is fast. Now, the way I remember these is if something's slow to itch, I, I remember it as in the colours make... The colours mean nothing, but for me, I I look at the colour and, and just think of, um, I make something up in my head, and I think, well, so red, if, if I had loads of oxygen, oxygen would need to be red, high, high red, because it's full of rich red blood cells. Um, bear with me one second, guys, I'll be back in, give me uh, 10 seconds, one minute. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, so if, if I look at type 1, I think type 1 has got to be, um, it's going to be slow twitch muscle fibres. So it's good for endurance events, as you can see there. So endurance events is going to need loads of oxygen because I'm going to be going for a long period of time. Now, do we know what mitochondria is? No. No? Okay, so mitochondria is like the battery of a cell. So within our cells in our body, we have all these little batteries, and these are mitochondria. So the, the, the more mitochondria we have, the more batteries we have in, within our cells, which is exactly what we need to keep going. So straight away, I think there's got to be a large amount of mitochondria. It's going to be red in colour. And it's going to be good for endurance events because it's slow twitch. Whereas fast twitch is going to have to be something that I would have thought would be more um, anaerobic or strength type training. We're only going to use it for a small amount of time. So it's going to be quite fast, fast glycotic fibers. And we only need a few batteries because they're not going to go for that long. So it's going to contain a low number of mitochondria. Um, so that's typically our fast twitch fibers yeah um <clears throat> so muscle fiber recruitment the nervous system controls muscular contraction motor units consist of a single motor nerve and all the muscle fibers it in um, innovates all of the fibers in that motor will be recruited when the stimulus is sent from the nervous system and this is known as the all or nothing law. So I'll read, read that section again. So all the fibres in the motor unit will be recruited when the stimulus is sent from the nerve system. So when that's the all or nothing law. And the reason I'm telling you that twice is because it's come up in a few papers, um, especially past papers. <clears throat> I don't know if it's going to come up this time, but it's well worth remembering. More units will be recruited when more strength is required. So obviously, the more, the, the heavier the weight, the heavier the load, um, will make a, a difference in your strength and the amount of units that you'll need to um, recruit. So there's your spinal cord. Obviously, it sends signals to the muscles, um, and then obviously you've got your motor units one and two that go out along the nerve. Now, when we're looking at muscles of the body, obviously we've got the anatomical t um, term, which is obviously the frontal, um, so anterior and posterior position. So you've got anterior there and posterior. Now the muscles, I want you to, I'm not going to go through the muscles today. 
because they're in your book so you can go through them because i'll just be talking through each muscle the same as the bones muscles and bones that's a given you should know that so it's really worth going over them and testing yourself on them testing other people when you're training think about the muscles you're using so when you're doing an exercise talk about the muscles in your head that you're working um it really helps your training as well because it will help you activate those muscles more so if you think about the muscle you're working when you're doing a certain exercise give you so if you're doing chest you think well i can really feel my pectoral major working now but then as you come down you can feel you, you feel your triceps as you push push back up again you feel your triceps and you can feel them contract so you're, you're thinking about the muscles as you're working um and it will really help with your training as well and development um origins so this is to give you a little idea because we we talk about muscles in like origins and insertions so an, or an origin of a muscle is usually near the midline of the body or superior whereas an insertion is usually away from the midline body uh midline of the body and it's inferior so when you're looking at the muscles in your books you'll see origins and insertions and it will give you an idea now of where the origin is and where the insertion is so you you need to remember that an origin is always near the midline of the body whereas an insertion um, sorry whereas an insertion is away from the midline and these are some of the muscles that you need to, well these are all the muscles you definitely need to know because they, they may come up in exams you can talk about it when you go into more detail um in any advanced practical especially for level three as well okay so the next section so we've got a couple more sections left so this next section we're going to talk about um is the circulatory system so we're going to be talking about the heart are you all with me? Are you all awake? Yep. Yep, good. Um, I bet you're all out in the sun and you're sitting outside in your garden. Um, okay, so we're going to look at the structure of the heart and the, the circulation. We're going to look at defining blood pressure as well. Um, so we're looking at the structure and function of blood cells and vessels. So the heart itself, the heart is located in the chest, slightly to the left. Um, it's a pump to maintain circulation, basically. It has two halves. You've got the right side, which pumps deoxygenated blood, and the left side, which pumps oxygenated blood. There are four chambers. The two upper collecting chambers are the atria, and the lower pumping chambers are the ventricles. Valves ensure the flow is one way and you have the coronary artery which supplies the heart with oxygenated blood so you've got your a diagram of your heart there so you should be able to see this in now obviously you've got your left and right atrium and your left left and right ventricle um Hello. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. So it dipped out then. Um, okay. So with the heart, the things you need to remember when you're going through the diagram is where the blood comes in and where it leaves. Um, so if we drop this diagram for a second and look at arteries so arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart supplying the vital organs and tissues and the way you remember it is you say a away so arteries a away it's going to have thicker muscular walls which allow blood to be shunted around the body um dealing with blood under high blood pressure so under high pressure sorry not blood pressure under high pressure so it needs to have quite thick, um, thicker walls than a vein would. There is one exception, the pulmonary, uh, the pulmonary artery. Um, the pulmonary artery transports deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs. 
So that's again important to remember. And then we've got veins. Veins carry deoxygenated blood back towards the heart. Um, I break it down and say vein. Vein. So it's going to be a thin muscular wall. It has valves to assist blood flow back to the heart and prevents back flow itself. So the, it all goes one way and it doesn't come back. The exception for the pulmonary vein, which transports oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart. So, go back to that diagram. So we've got our uh, pulmonary veins. So oxygenated blood goes in. Yeah. Pulmonary artery, deoxygenated blood, so takes the deoxygenated blood out. Where would the pulmonary artery, where does that, where does that take the deoxygenated blood? Does anyone know? Well, um, no, where does it take it? So, um, oh, damn it. What, give me two seconds. I've just got to get my battery, my Mac's about to go. One second, guys, sorry. Sorry guys, back again. All this technology and no charger. Um, right. So, what the question I asked was where I bet you've been frantically looking in your book. The pulmonary artery. Where would that take the deoxygenated blood? The muscle. Nope. So if it's if it's deoxygenated, it's got no oxygen in it. So. Oh, well. We want we want oxygen. So what organ would it need to go to to supply oxygen? Lungs. That's the one. So it would basically go into the lungs, produce oxygenated blood, and then the blood would go into what we call gaseous exchange, where the exchanges of gases um, happen via the alveoli, uh, alveoli um, and we get oxygen rich blood from the primary uh, pul pulmonary pulmonary veins and it goes back through the pulmonary vein here comes down through the left atrium down into the left ventricle and pumps out of the aorta and goes back out again yeah and then it goes a away out through the arteries And veins just basically bring the deoxygenated blood back in, with the exception of this pul uh, pulmonary artery, which takes it back to the lungs, ag lungs again, yeah? Um, we do have capillaries. Now, arteries become smaller to form arteroles, which link to capillaries. Capillaries are one cell thick and allows gaseous exchange, which was just I just said to you guys. Um, so from the capillaries, vein rules take blood into the veins, um, into the vena cava. And there's an, just gives you an idea of circulation from the left to the right side of the body. Um, you've got this diagram in your, in your books. But it's just showing you how it takes you from the left to the right side of the lung, around the body, from being oxygenated, and then coming once it's finished, comes back deoxygenated, and it comes back again. So we have pulmonary and systemic circulation. So pulmonary circulation is the flow of blood 
from the right side of the heart to the lungs and then back to the left side of the heart. The systemic circulation is the flow of blood from the left side of the heart to all parts of the body and this is under high pressure. Blood pressure is obviously um, when you're looking at the pressure within the arteries and when the, when the heart contracts it's measured in either systolic pressure or diastolic pressure. Systolic pressure is when the heart contracts, diastolic is when the heart relaxes. Regular exercise can lead to um, the reduction or normalization or normalizing of high blood pressure. So this gives you an idea. So your top, usually when you do a, a, a blood pressure reading, you get a top reading, which is your systolic, and then the bottom one is the diastolic. Obviously, this is contracting and this is relaxing. So if this is high, that's not very good because um, that's when you're when you're relaxed. So obviously it's only going to increase when your heart starts pumping. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you may want to um, look in your book for blood pressure. You might get a question on what optimal blood pressure is. 120 over 80, optimal. And you might get a, you might get a question on what is systolic or what is diastolic pressure. So really important to remember them as well. Um, they do crop up sometimes. I'll just make sure you, when you get to that section, nice little star just to remember it. Okay, so we're going to move on to the respiratory system now. There will be, there's always questions on the respiratory system. Usually, it's it's about how the the structure of of um, of how it works. So, for example, nose pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchus, bronchals, alveoli. So it's usually asked for the, the order. Um, where's the order? There's the order there. Nose, pharynx, la larynx, trachea. We're missing one. Bron we should be bronchal, uh, bronchus bronchals alveoli there's one missing there guys but it's not in your book in your book it should be correct if you've yeah. got your book out with you can you see it yeah so there's a mistake on this one obviously when you're breathing you've got respiratory muscles obviously the diaphragm it's a dome-shaped muscle when it contracts it flattens and increases the abdominal cavity um so we can take in more oxygen and then obviously we've got internal and external obliques. So external, pull the ribs upwards and outwards. Internal, pull the ribs downwards and inwards. Um, and if you, I, I don't know if you're a vegetarian, but if you've had spare ribs, there you go. Um, <laughs> now you know what you're eating. Um, which sounds disgusting. Uh, <clears throat> so gaseous exchange we said i said about this just a minute ago and that's when you've got deoxygenated blood that goes into the lungs and again you want to put a star next to this section because it comes it usually comes up uh, there's something about gaseous exchange usually that pops into the uh, exam questions so you've got gaseous exchange so diffusion diffusion is the exchange of gases so oxygen and carbon dioxide within the lungs. This occurs when the capillaries that surround the alveoli into the, in the lungs, and and it's the, the gaseous exchange is known as diffusion. Yeah. So please remember that one. So these are your alveoli, the little sacs that contain the oxygen, um, and these are your capillaries that are running all over here with deoxygenated and oxygenated blood. Cardiovascular respiratory systems, special populations, children, lower blood, less efficient temperature regulation, which is why kids always moan that they're cold or they're hot. Um, heart chambers are smaller, so heart rate is higher and stroke volume is lower, and they're less efficient in processing oxygen. Hence why kids are always blood red when they're running around like headless chickens. Um, young people 
so in 14 to 16 age range, decreased blood um, blood volume, poor temperature regulation again, uh, higher maximum heart rate, lower stroke volume, smaller heart, so a high uptake of oxygen, so a limited anaerobic ability. So the anaerobic ability isn't going to be as efficient as someone that was older. Um, but obviously that will change. And it, this is based on a sedentary, some of the sedentary. I mean, it's, this is not an elite. This is not a kid that may be an athlete or, you know, like Team GB or something like that. So they, although they're still developing, you know, they're, they're made very different. This is from, like I said, some of the sedentary lifestyle, really. So that's pregnant, cardiovascular system is enhanced. Blood pressure increases, stroke volume and cardiac output increases, resting heart rate will increase, and your venous return will decrease. So you just be aware of especially blood volumes and 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 um, the the cardiac output, the amount of card cardio someone's doing, um, and the amount of blood that's being supplied to the body. Aging. Decrease cardiac output, reducing uh, VO2 max, which is the reduction in VO2 max is the maximum amount of op oxygen you can uptake. Decrease maximum heart rate, increased blood pressure, and a reduced tolerance to lactic acid and fatigue. So basically, lactic acid is that burning you get when you train. When you get older, you get a reduced tolerance to it. So it means you burn out quicker, unfortunately. Um, disability, disability again. It depends. It's specific. It's specific, uh, specific to the um, individual. Um, everyone's. It's going to be a specific case based on that person. So it, 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 disability is a hard one because you need to um, have a look at their disability, talk them, uh, talk to them, and find out what their disability is. Um, Energy systems, so with energy systems now, um, what you need to know of energy systems is obviously energy comes from food we eat. So you've got carbohydrates, fats, and protein. Carbohydrates are stored in the muscle and the liver cells, and they are in the form of glycogen. Fats are stored as adip adipose tissue, where pr and protein are used as the building materials for growth and repair. Um, you've got this diagram in your book, or a diagram like this in the book, I think it's towards the back end. Um, so when we're looking at energy, energy is released into the body um, by the breakdown of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, to produce adenosine triphosphate, ATP, which is basically the body's energy currency. Where's the energy systems? Here we go. So energy systems. The first one, you've got your phosphocreatine system. It's used for high intensity, short duration activities lasting up to 15 seconds. And this is going to be basically anaerobic. The energy supplied would be by creatine phosphate. So this is stuff like your uh, 50 meter sprint, 100 meter sprint, you know, anything below 15, uh, 15 seconds and below is going to be the phosphocreatine system. Your lactic acid system, this is going to be moderate to high intensity, short duration activities lasting for 30 to 40 seconds. Again, it's still anaerobic, um, and, but the energy this time is going to be supplied by glycogen. Whereas the aerobic system, used for low to moderate intensity, lasting longer than 90 seconds or more, is going to be aerobic based. The energy is going to be from glycogen, obviously carbohydrates, and it's going to utilize fats for the energy as well. Um, it's going over the same thing. Where are we? Okay, so the important things to remember there are your three systems phosphocreatine system, lactic acid system, and aerobic system. I'll just cover them. It's a, I've gone over it very basic just to pull out some really important points for you, but it's definitely worth having a look at each section so you fully understand them as well. So, your phosphocreatine short events. This one's like your HIIT training, and this one's going to be for longer, you know, it might be a marathon, it might be a cycle, anything 90 seconds or more. 
Okay. Um, have you had a look at, uh, about the nervous system yet? Uh, I haven't. Okay. So the nervous system, basic. The nervous system is is you know without that we can't really function to be honest. So it controls all the actions of all body systems. It maintains what we call homeostasis. So it's the body's balance of what we would say equilibrium so it's keeping our body in check basically through through hormones and through our our organs so we have sensory input which is senses to change inside and outside the body we have an interpretation which is to analyze and interpret incoming information and we have the motor output which is to respond to the information by activating the relevant body systems so the nervous system, it goes into more detail at level three, but at level two, you need to know that obviously the nervous system consists of the central nervous system, which is the brain and, um, and spinal cord. You've got the peripheral nervous system, which um, sends messages to the brain and then takes messages back out from the brain. And then two branches, which is somatic and autonomic. Now, Where's my diagram? Right, okay, I don't want to do that. That's rubbish. Okay, you've got, so I should have had a diagram on there. It's not on there for some reason. Sorry, guys. So if you're looking at the central, central nervous system, this explain this in more detail. You've got, you should have a diagram in your books, but so you've got the central nervous system, which is like the, me, the, like the main command, and you've got the peripheral nervous system, which is like the messenger. So the messenger sends word to the king and the king decides what's going to happen with the kingdom and the peripheral nervous system takes that order and says this is what you're going to do so for example if i was to touch something now that's boiling hot so i touch it my peripheral nervous system would send a signal to the brain and say this is really hot the brain would go so what action would i need to take the brain would go right you need to take your hand off the peripheral nervous system would then send that signal back to the back through the nerves and activate my hand to move my hand. So the, you've got the peripheral nervous system, central nervous system, and, and back through the peripheral nervous system again to, to tell you what you've got to do. Now, it branches out to these two here, somatic and autonomic. Somatic is in our consciousness where autonomic isn't in our consciousness so when i touched something that was hot the peripheral nervous system sent a signal to the brain the brain then sent the the action to the peripheral nervous system which activated was it in my consciousness to remove my hand or was it not in my consciousness not what do you think point. Not so, so you think it was not in the country? Okay. So, I understand because you think it was like an autonomic, like an automatic response to take your hand off, but it was, but it was still in my consciousness. Whereas an autonomic would be something like hormones. So, mm -hmm. if I put it in another way, so somatic is in our consciousness. So that's like touch, smell, something that we we decide we can do. Um, so we decide what happens. Um, whereas when it's not when it's not in our consciousness, it's going to be autonomic. So, for example, um, if you've ever stressed out about something or been like anxious about something or nervous, um, or you've had an argument with someone, that's a common one. If you've had an argument with someone and or a heated discussion, straight away you start to get wound up and, and your heart and your heart rate increases, doesn't it? You start to get a bit annoyed by someone. They they're aggravated, your heart rate's increasing. Um, you know, if it's nerves, you, you might start start getting nerves, you feel a rush of energy. And that basically what happens is is your your peripheral nervous system says, right, there's someone in your way and they're they're giving you they get, they're not you're not agreeing with what they're 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 doing or they're aggravating you. Your central nervous system sends a signal through the peripheral nervous system to the autonomic system, which is not in our consciousness, and this activates a hormone. So it will say 
it'll activate the adrenal uh, the um adrenal glands and it will secrete adrenaline so all of a sudden you start secreting the hormone adrenaline to help you fight or flight so you either get in there and have an argument with someone or you just leave because you your adrenaline for you activates it, it makes you go out of the situation um so that's that would be an autonomic response so anything that's not in our consciousness it's autonomic anything that's in our consciousness is somatic does that make sense are you with me yeah you sure um okay so that was basically um obviously with the nervous system so response to training for example so strengthening and growing new connections within the nervous system speeding up the frequency of nerve impulses to motor units improved synchronized recruitment of motor units resulting in stronger muscle contractions and in for special populations, disorders of this very, uh, very complex system can affect all special populations. There are hundreds of disabilities and neurological diseases and disorders. This is a very complex and requires specialist knowledge and care. Basically, you should have more training before you deal with anyone of a special population or background when you're dealing with anything to do with the brain. Um, but obviously, when you're dealing with something uh, with the nervous system, it's obviously going to affect people in different ways, especially someone that um, hasn't got much good, uh, hasn't got a very good control of their body system. So it just helps helps them activate their bodies a little bit more. Um, we have covered loads in a short space of time. That is pretty much everything for a recap of what you need to go through, um, and hopefully it sort of give you a kickstart to go through your manual a little bit more um and then brush up on some of the things you weren't sure on um and then obviously we can get you booked in for exams was there any questions no this is what i needed just to kind of put me on the in the right place really put in the right, yeah no i get that abdul was that all right yeah good yeah and you're really I've just got to go read through all the, uh, the different sections. Yeah, once you get once you go through it all, it'll really help you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know now. I'll go to the books now. What we've gone through, that's because all those 